back in the room. Um, I was uh, part of a group uh, with excellent facilitation and really enjoyed the workshop. So I hope you all had a similar experience and that you'll be able to feed back now around some of the questions. We have um, until about 4.20 when hopefully we can go upstairs again and have some wine and cheese. And before we go, I'll tell you a little bit about what's happening with the television and radio interviews, etc., and how you'll be able to keep up with all of today's discussion online. So perhaps we could start um, by talking about one of the topics that we discussed in the workshops, which is should commercial companies have a role in funding and the conduct of clinical research? Now, there is a roving microscope microscope, microphone, um, that will come to you, and I have one here if we need to do one at the front. So could we get some comments around this question from any of you, in fact, in the room, but clearly some of the facilitators may wish to feed back on this question. Yes, please, here at the front, and I have... Uh, we discussed about this um, uh, in our group, and the fact is that any kind of clinical research uh, need, needs funding, and sometimes in funding is quite big that um, every organization cannot afford it. But it is also a fact the commercial companies, especially drug companies, do, do have a lot of funding, and they fund clinical research. Sometimes they may have a vested interest Suppose they're doing a clinical trial and a drug, they want to see that that drug comes to the market and they can make a profit out of it. But as long as they're doing the research according to the strict governance arrangement and a proportion of the funding, and that is again debatable how much, yeah. comes back to clinical research, it's a good idea. Yeah. After all, everybody who does business does for a profit. Yeah. So why not commercial companies? Great, thank you very much very much for those helpful comments. I don't know if any of you uh, wish to comment further on that question. Facilitators? Yes, at the back there. Thank you very much indeed. Um, in our group, uh, we had uh, participants and researchers together and we had a bit of debate really over whether whether you would take part in something that was for a commercial interest as opposed to something which was for the public good, um, something which was associated with the NHS. But then it was highlighted that, that really commercial organisations are also working for the public good by putting their money into developing drugs, many of which never come to the market, never come to fruition. Um, and that they have they have access to the best researchers, best trials, and so we, we never really resolved it. Um, but the the crux of the question seemed to be whether it was acting in the public good to have commercial. So I think companies. you're saying that as you discussed it and you got more information fed in, perhaps your view changed as you understood that relationship between commercial NHS patient and money. So. Yeah, I think the crux of it was, if you have commercial companies involved, does that act for the public good of developing um, trials? Yes, good. Thank you. Two more comments down, two rows. We're probably going to say the same thing because we're, we were in the same group, but um, hopefully, hopefully not. Um, we had an interesting view on this, I think, that maybe other group members could chip in on if I've got it wrong. But um, some people actually felt that, you know, that there are actually great benefits to having commercial companies involved in the funding and conduct of clinical research because they can be less bureaucratic and more responsive um, in trials. And I think... The, the comment was also made, was, is that in, in Scotland, any research is good. Discuss. Yeah. <laughs> well, perhaps I just wanted to add that it wasn't a question of whether there should be a role, because there is a role, and it's a fact. So, and it's a matter, the question was about whether uh, there could be efficient regulation in terms of uh, balancing uh, commercial benefits with the benefit to the public. I think that's what our colleague at the front started out by saying. 
Yeah. We're all from the same group. Okay. <laughs> yes. Very helpful. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I Two things I'd like to mention uh, from our group was that the, the boundary between commercial and non-commercial is changing and people uh, at some point may not be involved in a commercial company uh, in, who are doing research, but that situation may change. Uh, the university gives a lot of examples of that. And the other was the, the phase where uh, it may be more cost effective or it is much cheaper for research to happen within an institution up to phase two and maybe phase three and four makes it more viable for a commercial interest to take that on yes. once something has been established. So there's a place for it. Yes. But also the boundaries between what's commercial and what isn't is changing. Yes. So did everybody understand that? I think that was that many institutions, usually universities and the NHS, are deriving small molecules or antibodies which after they've been tested to a certain level, maybe phase two in Steve's definition, move on to a very expensive phase that require the advantages of a commercial company with all its setup. Is that a summary? Th that, that works too. And I think the example I was using from our group was someone who said it was actually uh, more cost effective for a, a, a body or institution to carry out phase one to three. Um, because they can do it, uh, uh, it's much, a yeah. uh, cost per unit, it's less. Right. And then at some point that makes the, uh, the outcome of that phase uh, commercially viable to take further. Very interesting comment because many companies I think are using universities to do certain phases of their study. Yes. Because they get better value there in yes. their own facilities. I think that's what I was trying to say, yeah. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I just want to add a comment there from the same group, um, and it was very much a similar comment to the first gentleman made about the nece necessity for the uh, the cost of research to involve commercial companies, but the key word is transparency, sometimes transparency with it, so that it's okay if they're involved, but there must be clear guidelines on um, how much they're involved and the, the, what the conflicts of interest are. Sure. Superb. Thank you for those comments. Um, Will we move on? But you don't need to forget a question because we've moved on, because they may link together. So the next question we were interested in hearing your views on was, should steps be taken then to redistribute any profits or benefits from commercial research? And if so, in what form would that sort of benefit take for the public or NHS? Yes? Have a comment in the middle. Thank you. Um, yeah, used to see, well, in our table we had, we happened to have um, a, a wonderful patient who underwent a um, clinical trial, so of course we exploited her very much um, uh, for all these questions, um, and I think the, the sense I got uh, from her was that uh, there, there was a very kind of um, generous uh, kind of uh, approach to all of this that had to do with, you know, um, kind of providing the benefits of the research for the next generation and thinking in terms of how we ourselves benefit from what has happened in the last 50 years uh, and seeing it as a process in the long term rather than... Um, so, and although I think we did press her to see if, if she would be keen on some kind of um, you know, uh, uh, reward of any kind, even, you know, not necessary money, perhaps uh, money donated to a charity of her cho uh, choice or something like that. Um, and, and she kept insisting in the idea of the, for the public good. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that, I think that that kind of summarizes. Um, um, and then everyone else was quite ambivalent in the sense that we, we couldn't see how that could be oper um, make operational, actually. Okay. Um, there were no straightforward mechanisms. And it could open very, it could have um, unintended consequences and perversive incentives, even perhaps. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, thank you very much for that. Other comments, yes? Well, I think we discussed this question from a little bit different perspective, uh, and uh, the concerns were mostly around the so-called partici uh, professional participants for whom uh, financial compensation became the target itself. So we were discussing uh, this kind of issues, how to, on one hand, to uh, redistribute benefits and profits and to um, appreciate the participants, but on the other hand, to avoid those cases when uh, certain members of the public becoming, as I called it, professional participants, looking for those um, 
um, research which actually uh, pay uh, something uh, in, in return. Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, so you're balancing yourself between some people using it as a profession almost to get money to be in a trial as compared to the other types of benefits society could have by having altruistic involvement and trying to balance that. Thank you for that. And at the front here. Um, oh, here first and then at the front. Thank you. Um, in our group, um, what we spoke about was the actual contribution by charities and also public funds in the sort of early stages of research that might eventually act, um, actually create profit for commercial um, companies and the way of re redistributing the profits that might be made then into back into um, these charities or the sort of um, the UK purse. Um, there's a sort of general consensus that that should be done, but how it should be done <laughs> was a bit more difficult and we sort of, um, we talked about it a bit, but then we realised that it was a quite a complex issue. Yes. I'm, I'm not sure if there is anyone here from a company and I don't want to pinpoint you, but I, I guess I would add here that we all think about the profits, but what we don't think about are those multitudinous agents that fail and there are huge costs to that. So were we, I guess, thinking of distributing the profits, we'd have to think of distributing the negative profits, the costs for some of those many agents that never go further than a phase one or a phase two trial. So there's the plus side for the commercial companies as well as the negative. David, can you remember how much it costs overall for a drug company to get a new drug into um, actual practice these days? It's millions, isn't it? Hundreds of millions? Yeah. And I think of two billion is the average, I think. It's yeah. a huge amount of money. Yeah, so be, and that's because so many drugs fail, yeah. and you've funded all that research and for one that actually spins out, as we say. Um, so I, I agree with you. It's just a question of balancing the profit and loss situation. Well, I suppose it's still profit. It is still profit at the end. Yeah, at the end. And there was a question, a comment here at the front. That no, it's, it sort of ties in because I was in the same group. Okay. Um, but it was also. Well, one, one of the points was that it should feed back into the basic research that, that the companies ultimately base their phase three, phase four trials on, so that a lot of the basic research is done by, funded by public money and, and by, by public research. And then obviously the companies are the ones that, that then take that further and make money with it and that should automatically somehow feed back. But there was that general problem of how do you do that, who gets the money, um, what happens to all the people that have done research that never led to anything and, and it, it, we, as we said, we never found a solution to the, to the entire problem. I guess again, correct me, Cancer Research UK and the MRC both have ways of actually helping to facilitate many of the trials. So they try as much as they can to keep some of the profits coming back in to facilitate more research. And, and I guess it is that element of competition between those funding groups and their ability to keep the cycle of funding going and the commercial ones who take on maybe riskier projects or buy companies, maybe keeping a joint ownership with a university or a research you know, group. So there are different models, aren't there, for different um, products that come out. Again, I'll move on, but again, don't feel you can't comment on a previous question. So the next one is our, whoops, our current legal and governance arrangements on personal data adequate. And this one seemed to generate a lot of comment and a lot of interest and a lot of concern. So again, did you have comments from your own groups for this? Yes, at the front. Right, the short answer is no. <laughs> now, uh, because I sit on the ethics committee, I have experience of dealing with applications on a daily basis, you see. And what we'd like to see in every application that comes is that the clinician or GP who is looking after the patient should have access to all the personal data and then once consent has been obtained, and the way we like to see consent obtained is the clinician gives the information to the participant patient and tells them this research is going to take place, are you interested? And would you like your name to be given to the researcher? And if he's happy, then the researcher is given the name and address, contact details of the would-be participant. The researcher then contacts the participant 
and discusses the patient information sheet in detail. And if he is happy, then he gives his consent. And it is only after consent that the researcher can have access to the personal data, not before that. Okay. Also, there are various level of consent, whether he can full have full access to all personal data and health information, that is one. Second, the data can be pseudo-anonymized. So there will be a link, there will be a code, and only the chief investigator can break that code and access information if necessary. Yeah. And the third one is fully anonymized when nobody on the earth can access that information. Yes. And that can be widely available because that is fully anonymized data. So the governance arrangements are there, but I don't think they are fully adhered to. And whenever we see a deficiency in the application form, we ask the researcher or the applicant to revise the application and resubmit it. Excellent. Thank you. That's very helpful. Very clear. Other comments? Uh, I think we have a colleague there. And then the next row, two back. I don't have long comments, but I think that um, people in my table agree that the regulation is good, but uh, we can't sure that the anonymous and all the regulation is, I mean, Assure that no anonymous of the people. It's difficult to show that people sharing or participating on clinical research are anonymous exactly, especially when that's related to their tissues and their samples. Yeah. So they can know their DNA and everything. And they we don't have the consensus about that. People don't still even if they don't like so much about all the procedures and regulation, but they say until now we don't so much I mean uh, uh, satisfied with going and give us samples, especially for Generation Scotland and everything, so that we are not sure where it's going to be used and everything, and we don't know if they know about us or not, or really uh, agency from agency from agency using this information, this will, the anonymous will lose, and so they know the privacy will be interrupted yes. and something like that. Yes, excellent. Thank yeah. you very much indeed. Yes, so with some long-term projects like Generation Scotland, that people still have concerns that over time you'll lose that anonymity potentially. Very helpful. And two rows back. Thank you. Just following on from that, there was some agreement in our group that um, confidentiality was maybe more important to people than anonymization. But there was a lot of concern perhaps about um, future security breaches and you know how how data is managed. Um, and I, I think there was, you, you know, the, the, there was probably some concern around that issue. Okay, thank you. We, we had, um, and I will not point to a younger colleague at our table who was regarded as being part of the Facebook generation, and there was, I was, there was a question as to whether different generations may have slightly different views about confidentiality maybe, but anonymity as well. So it is a very interesting topic, I think, that should be taken further in terms of public understanding. <coughs> Gentleman in the middle there. One of our participants mentioned that the, the CHI number, I was trying to find my notes, the name of that number, but that was an, in, that was an identifying number yeah. and that there was some concern that um, that, that, not, that is not adequately protected or will not be. And I think that is a general feeling, if I'm not incorrect. I think it's an incredibly valuable number for Scotland and I think we're unique in having it. It's based on date of birth and other yes. things. But I think there is a general concern, maybe legally, I'm not sure where Sean is, um, about that number being as anonymous as we had thought once upon a time. Yes, and the gentleman next to you. Yeah, just very quickly, because uh, although we, we talk about anonymity as a, a positive thing most of the time, uh, there, are, there are some considerations that I found very interesting in our table. Someone said, well, so what, happen, uh, what happens when you actually incidentally find that that particular person has an illness? Um, you know, anonymity there might be actually life-threatening. Yes. And uh, again, at our table, there's a colleague who takes part in clinical trials who was talking about the fact that that's all part of the consent process that you decide at the beginning how you want to be informed about that sort of thing, which is terribly important. And I just mentioned that, I, is it, others will know, Salt Lake City, I think, the Utah, 
and, and I, Iceland have very interesting projects where the bulk of the population's public record of health is um, freely available to researchers. I don't know enough about their confidentiality and anonymity, but I think there are different models in different countries or different parts of countries that are not too dissimilar in size to Scotland, Utah, Iceland's much smaller, but how they're using their data as a country to try to work with commercial companies in Iceland, <coughs> decode, to actually generate information and then treatments that might bring money back into the country. It hasn't so far, I think, brought much back into Iceland, but it's an interesting model that I guess our government is interested in the public's view on. Yes, again, in the middle. Yeah, just on that very same thing, actually. Uh, yeah, just actually following up, you, you mentioned informed consent, but here we, our table discussed another dilemma, which is, um, you know, if informed consent is too narrow, uh, you might be excluding p the, its potential use in the future mm -hmm. for other uh, applications. Yeah. If it's too broad, that might hinder the informed nature of the consent itself at yeah. the point of consent. So that's, that's another and huge dilemma. That's what your colleague next to you was referring to when he was talking about Generation Scotland and not knowing how it will be usable in five, ten years, and what will come from it. <coughs> uh, at the front, uh, there's one next I to you, David. I just to make a comment David? about the, the potential value of, uh, I think it's a very critical uh, point you make because uh, we, we've, uh, I've for years had uh, data collection of patients who gave their DNA 20 years ago and uh, we were initially restricted very much to what we could use that for and clearly as things have moved forward there's lots of other things which would be really very useful to, to have the uh, DNA used for and so um, the only way of getting that is to go back and ask the participants for permission to specifically look at, you know, I was looking at bones to look at heart disease for example. Um, the, the way around it now, of course, is that applications go to a, a different in a different way to ethics, looking for an application for a biobank, which then does open up the opportunity to use those. It's obviously a different information sheet and a different consent that you sign, but at least it opens it up to use it for different uh, disease areas, if you like. Mm. Thank you. Yes, so you've had to go back to ethics for a yeah. broader yeah. use. So I'm failing time-wise, I can see. I can hear the wine being poured upstairs and we've still got four questions. Should personal genomic information, including incidental findings, be fed back to individual participants? So again, um, any comments around that particularly? Yes, again, our colleague. Again, in our table, there, is, there wasn't a consensus about that. Some of them said that it's uh, not everything should be informed for the participant especially for incident, incidental finding. And that would, if it's not useful for them or if it's affect them, it's not, I mean, no sense to give them the information. In addition to that, the large scale research when that's going with the generic uh, generation Scotland, if we got information that it's difficult to come back for each individual and say, okay, you have things or we discover things, but they have the right to have, I mean, not the but all the public to have the idea about the findings and everything's uh, got from the study itself. I mean. Yes. So a newsletter type approach exactly. on the results rather than a person to person. Person to person. That's on large scale. Yes. Uh, I'm going to put the next question up and you can still have a comment because it's very similar in that it says should more be done to feedback research findings to participants. So it's part of a sequence. Yeah. Well, with the with the second question, it was sort of unanimously yes. Um, that there's many different ways and very kind of cheap electronic ways to do that now. Um, if a participant wants to, then feeding back is is possible. Um, when it comes to personal genomic information, it, the the idea was yes, um, but only if the adequate support is there. If, if it's to do with um, risk of disease or uh, possibly having a disease, that um, if if you've not built in that there's adequate support, and the comparison was made here with sort of um, direct to consumer testing over the internet where no support is provided, then just providing information but not explaining the information, not informing the person and not providing the support um, makes it possibly more damaging than not providing it at all. No, that's extremely relevant. And uh, I think there's one at the back on the left and then one at the back on the right. Uh, I don't know your names. But the left, yes. 
So the um, the last two questions, um, the penultimate question, our group were a bit split on in that some people were adamant that they, they really wouldn't want to know um, what the genomic information said and others were quite enthusiastic to know. Um, and so I suppose that the, the sensible resolution of that is to, to state a preference yes. beforehand. Um, but then will you ever know what you're really stating a preference for? And the final one, um, whether feedback should be given in general, was a, a adamant yes from the whole group. And um, it was suggested that more focus groups, more um, public engagement events like today would be the best way to feedback findings, but also to involve patients in the design of future studies. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, so for the personal um, feedback, um, there was a sort of a general feeling of that there was a duty of care or responsibility. So similar to one of the comments um, before about there would have to be some sort of aftercare or the facilities there to have the sort of emotional support if that was if that was there. Um, but there was a feeling that if there was information um, gained about a treatable disease or that if the patient found out about it, there would be a beneficial effect. Um, then, then the patient should be informed. Um, but there was a distinction made about different types of study. So, for example, a specific study, if your information was being, for example, about breast cancer study, then you might hear back about those specific things. If it's a general one, for example, a genomics project, it would be very, it might have different um, regulations because it's a more of a sort of general study. And then to the last question, um, there was a feeling that yes, because it encourages people to get involved, um, people like getting the feedback, they're curious about how their um, information has been used. Um, and then we actually had examples that it sounds as though that that does happen through things like um, updates and newsletters and such like, and that people were quite happy um, with that. But obviously if there was more, more funding, then events like today um, would be beneficial. Yes. Okay, that's really excellent views, broad range of views. So if we just move on to the second last question, so some, should patients and or the public be directly involved in the design, monitoring and governance of clinical research? And if so, how? And we already had a comment from the back uh, on that topic, but now more. Uh, we agree that, I mean, in the whole table, they agree that, uh, yes, they, they're very helpful to be involved in all stages of uh, clinical research. Um, in overall, and they're already done. They involved lots of uh, in public organization representative for the public to uh, to express their ideas. Uh, some of the participants say that uh, it's uh, very helpful to also include people that have idea against the clinical research, and so know exactly uh, what they feel and how they feel that, and this give them encourage to they know that somebody. Uh, think about their feeling and their opinion and everything's uh, like that. Also, some of the participants mentioned something about school level. If we return to stu I mean to student and to people and to explain to them how that's useful and also get their opinion and something like that, it would be useful for involvement and different shape of involving people. Thank you very much. So I guess a, a general view that I think most of most of us agree that we should have a wide view from the public. Uh, we shouldn't be biased in terms of our public engagement, just as we try not to be biased in terms of clinical trials. We should make sure we uh, are able to look at the breadth of the public in Scotland and involve them. And again, there's another comment there in the middle. It comes. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we talked a lot about public engagement. Now, so we made the, critici the, the usual criticism of uh, self-selected pu publics and then the problems that that brings. Um, but another participant mentioned, um, you know, the logic of citizen duties and how that kind of uh, representative sample logic, it doesn't have to be a small duty, it can be a bigger kind of assembly. All of that could be put to good use. Um, and the parallels in other areas, uh, participatory policy making is, is spreading across the NHS and local governments. So there's something to learn across areas as well. And there's no reason why research couldn't be open like that. Good. Thank you very much indeed. And then our last question is, should more clinical research be undertaken in Scotland as compared to other places? So what would you like to say about that? 
Yes. Yes. Go back. <laughs> they mentioned something about linking that to also America, European, and all the studies that would prevent from duplicating work and also duplicating work. Duplicating work and uh, will help the you not. Know, I mean, uh, speed the work of clinical research and avoid a uh, lot of so much costs that would happen if we repeated work again and again and again. So we it's yes. To something someone said here about transparency in this research is basically publishing all of the data so that people who are doing research similarly somewhere else don't have to repeat it necessarily. Yes, there's another two comments back. Thank you. Thank you. A very interesting topic about so-called Cinderella diseases, which are not really on the top agenda, yeah. and comparing to uh, uh, wide campaigns on cancer, there are some diseases which are not really yeah. r properly researched, so uh, perhaps that was one of the suggestions to pay more attention to so-called uncomfortable diseases yeah. that are not uh, in the public eye at yeah. the moment. Hi there. Um, a slightly different view on this, which I don't think we discussed in our group. With the closure of two of the main largest phase one clinics in Scotland within the last six months, I, I'm concerned personally that the amount of phase one clinical research has just basically just gone down like that in Scotland. Are you referring to Glasgow? Or? No, um, Chilton and also Quotient Clinical. Um, both two large of the two main independent CROs that have both closed down the last six months. There is now, I, I think I'm correcting saying, there's now no large phase one healthy volunteer site left in Scotland for healthy volunteers. There's, there's some in Glasgow, am I right? There might, yeah, yeah, I'm, I know there's bits, there's, there's bits, but I'm not too sure what's happening elsewhere. But personally, that's a real concern to me, and I'd like to know why yes. this industry appears to be going downhill and what has been done about it. And I, I, mean, I mean, we didn't really discuss that. that, but that's my, one of my main concerns, because without that phase one research coming through yep. to produce the new drugs, there won't be new well, drugs to do. I certainly know that the first in man trials, there are new, much stiffer regulations since the GTN 1412 situation. Right. But I don't think these uh, units had, uh, had that as a problem. I'm not sure. But you certainly no, they both had near to. But no, that's not. Both of those sites had the supplementary accreditation okay. and could review those higher standard of I think drugs. If you move over, we may get an answer. Well, um, apparently Edinburgh University, the Wellcome Trust Clinical Research Facility, has, is just about to receive their phase one accreditation. And I think that's, I mean, that's the first academic institute in the country to, to receive that, and that's in Edinburgh, and that's brilliant. So, I mean, the, on, on the one hand, the commercial sector is going downhill, but I think the academic sector is trying their best to, to meet the demand. Um, I presume that the commercial situation is because of the economic climate and it's not particularly to do with phase one it's to do with much broader issues could you place the mic back sorry okay if we could go backward to uh, the lady in blue thank you oh mine was on a, a slightly different tack um entirely um which was more our answering of this question kind of came off the back of talking about why you take a part in clinical research at all, which was for the greater good and that we all benefit for people, from people in the past who have taken part in clinical research and that we all benefit from the NHS in Scotland and that perhaps taking part in research should be linked in some way to the benefit that we, we glean from receiving the NHS and from receiving drugs in the past and therefore you should almost have a personal obligation to take part in research, um, which is slightly... A very good note on which to finish, might I say. Fantastic. Can I compliment you as an audience on your participation? There's so many of you still here. It's a very high yield for about 4.30 in the afternoon. I'm very impressed, and I want to compliment Steve Sturdy and Jane Wilkin, who have organised this conference put huge amounts of effort into it. I think it's been a fantastic day. So thank you and your team. Some of you were keen to know about the BBC, and apparently the BBC is going to have a very tiny segment of this at 6.30 on Reporting Scotland, about two minutes. So you need to be watching it carefully to see it happen. There may well be something at 10 p.m. tonight on politics today uh, on the radio. Did you say Radio Scotland? Oh, excellent. 
right. Jen Gage is going to work over the next week or two to get all the slides on our website, as well as, I guess, a summary of the workshops and the views that were expressed. Um, we would be delighted if you could all fill in your evaluation forms and leave them at the front desk with your badge um, once you have uh, finished for the afternoon. But before you go, please go upstairs and, and have a drink and some cheese and biscuits before you head off. And once again, thank you. It's been one of the most interesting days I've attended for a long time. So thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.